Good morning. Uh, thank you for inviting me to do this presentation. I will be presenting a tour through published papers for the past two years. I should disclose upfront that it is slanted towards my perspective, which is largely orientated to clinical practice, but with a commitment to the evidence and scientific insights into this topic and others in the field of child and adolescent psychiatry. My clinical practice is to assess and manage the more severe end of ADHD presentations, along with the associated comorbidities in an inpatient context. So I don't often see the more common manifestations of ADHD. The choice of articles reviewed has therefore been influenced by this. I've mostly reviewed meta-analyses and uh, systematic reviews, but also some research studies. You will see from the outline that I have focused on three areas, um, quite an, a, a number of articles. Um, uh, it seemed like a broad, broad approach would be quite helpful. So essentially, I'm providing you with snapshots um, of each article and the references are provided at the end for those of you who want to delve deeper. Um, I've divided the um, presentation into three areas. Um, the first um, focused on research, which is really a, a single article, and then a couple of articles looking at more clinical concepts. Um, uh, and then thirdly, um, focused on ADHD risk markers. So the first research review um, summarizes the most important advances during the past 20 years. The authors Samuel Cortez and David Kogel need little introduction, having published prolifically during the past few years. Um, this review was published two years ago. It's quite brief, but it really provides a, t a, a lovely um, uh, um, uh, overview of the main scientific advances and it certainly was a springboard for the rest of the articles reviewed. And um, these are the areas um, that they discuss um, starting with diagnostic definitions in the transition from DSM-4 to DSM-5, epidemiology and then genetic and neuroimaging um, research and then some aspects of treatments, which I have not really gone into um, for this presentation. So looking at um, neuroimaging um, research, um, initial models focused on specific um, brain areas um, using structural um, MRI. But a major paradigm shift has been to conceptualize dysfunctions um, within brain neural networks. Um, the authors state that the default network hypothesis is arguably one of the most inspiring proposals in the neuroscience of ADHD over the past 20 years. I'm sure um, most of you are familiar with this, but um, what, what they say is that lapses in attention um, in ADHD are caused by inappropriate intrusion of the default network, which are the resting networks, during activities served by task positive uh, networks. And then looking at um, genetic and environment um, based research, we well familiar with um, environmental, proposed environmental causes of ADHD, but looking at genetics, um, a highly heritable condition with consensus estimates at 70 to 80 percent heritability. And in terms of um, research approaches, it focused initially on candidate genes and then on genome wide association studies with a groundbreaking study which looked at genomic data of 20, about 21,000 individuals with ADHD and for the first time identified 304 common variables distributed in 12 loci that surpassed the threshold of genome-wide significance. And then the third area would be to look at copy number variants. Um, the article um, that first described 
um, the, the, the discovery was in Nature Genetics um, early last year, for those of you who would like to read the original article. Um, the authors um, end um, by um, highlighting a few issues that they believe require clarification and future um, research. And the first is in the diagnostic area where they feel that we should look more to precise definitions of functional impairment. Um, there's, they state that there is an argument that attention, inattention should carry more weight. Um, and then how best to integrate different sources of information. Um, they mention uh, this concept of sluggish cognitive tempo and um, I wonder whether this should be seen as a separate diagnostic entity or a separate type of ADHD. I did look at some of those articles but decided not to include them. And then the controversial issue about how to conceptualise ADHD uh, neuro as a neurodevelopmental disorder or as a condition that can emerge in adulthood de novo. They then call for more um, population-based studies from other continents and then further um, genetic and neuroimaging studies by um, via multidisciplinary collaborations um, in order to combine large data sets. Um, the next area then will be looking at um, clinical concepts and I will start um, with diagnostic issues by looking at an, uh, articles um, which um, focus on the concept of so-called late diagnosed ADHD and um, subthreshold symptoms of ADHD. Um, on the uh, at the top right is a um, quotation from Samuel Cortez when he says that this is one of the most controversial topics that is far from being resolved. And um, this annual review um, with the title Does Late Onset ADHD Hyperactivity um, Exist? Um, looks into this um, concept um, in, and in terms of its outline, it starts off by looking back at ADHD as a neurodevelopmental disorder, and it reviews nine prospective studies looking at later emerging ADHD. Um, and then also just briefly touches on polygenic risk and cognitive impairments. Historically, um, this is a condition that was first described in 1798. And um, you will see on the top right um, a description, um, which is actually fairly accurate for what we see in, uh, particularly in boys, in young boys. And uh, what the authors then uh, say is that um, early studies suggest that during childhood and adolescence, the majority show onset of some symptoms with impairment before seven, but then a significant number of them actually report onset between seven and 16 years, difficulties being biased reporting and um, retrospective recall. In terms of the um, prospective studies, um, the Dun Eden study, I'm sure you're well um, uh, uh, familiar with, and then the environmental risk study, uh, the MTA study, there was twin studies, um, the MTA study also included a closer look at comorbidities in this late onset, uh, onset group um, via an expert panel, really um, to ensure that some of that ADHD was not attributed to another disorder. And after uh, further exclusion found that 33% of the sample still met late onset ADHD criteria. Um, in terms of polygenic risk markers, they found that um, childhood diagnosed and persisters had the highest levels of uh, polygenic risk scores um, compared to late onset uh, diagnosed um, uh, patients. 
and cognitive deficits seem to persist from childhood into adulthood, including problems with um, learning and broad scores in um, intelligence quotients. Possible explanations for late onset ADHD were discussed that it might be to do with informant uh, reporting, um, that it might be another disorder, it might be sub-threshold um, presentations, or that um, it may have been masked by a favourable family environment or higher IQ. The authors didn't mention gender, or maybe I didn't recall it, but I certainly think that gender is a factor in this as well. The next um, uh, study is a twin study um, where the authors took a developmental approach to examine outcomes among remittent, persistent and late onset ADHD diagnosed sufferers. The sample was from the e-risk study um, and there were 56% of them were monozygotic twins and 46% dizygotic twins. Again, because of time, I'm not going to go into this in detail, but you will see the graphs showing poorer outcomes for ADHD um, uh, affected twins compared to unaffected twins across a range of outcomes, including um, symptoms, substance abuse, um, social isolation, and so forth. Um, the next article is about um, subsyndromal symptoms. And this article was of, of particular interest to me in relation to an HIV research study I'm involved in, where I have um, detected more children presenting with subthreshold symptoms of disorders. And besides raising questions about methodology, um, of the methodological issues about the study also raised um, questions around uh, reporter bias and impairment thresholds and so forth. This article was published in the Journal of Clinical Psychiatry. The main author is Joseph Biederman, well known in the field of ADHD and childhood bipolar disorder. Um, and the authors really are saying that these children with subthreshold symptoms who fail to meet criteria for the disorder may present with significant um, dysfunction. Um, in terms of the definitions, you will see it there on the right hand side. And so it would be age of onset beyond seven years, but also fewer diagnostic uh, criteria under DSM-3 um, and 4. Um, in terms of the study, there were almost 3,000 um, patients um, who underwent um, extensive assessments um, and later on um, were, the data was re-looked at to see whether they would fall within the threshold under a DSM, under DSM-5. Um, the key points that the authors highlighted are that insights are lacking about these children who do not meet full criteria. Um, and the significant point here, I would say, is that even when they re-looked at the sample using DSM-5 criteria, only a minority actually received um, a diagnosis. Um, and it really stressed the arbitrariness of the age criteria and that there needs to be a more multifactorial um, perspective of ADHD. Um, they um, assert that ADHD may be a disorder with a continuum of ages of onset, with some presenting with symptoms earlier and others later. Moving on to the next um, article, which is a review um, covering um, emotional dysregulation in children with ADHD. This review by Stephen Ferrone and colleagues was published in the Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry also in 2019. 
I was attracted to this paper as currently I have a few patients in my ward with extreme emotional dysregulation and aggression, all three with multiple comorbidities, but with ADHD being the common uh, diagnosis um, among them. Um, the review covers conceptual issues around how we conceptualize and describe emotion symptoms, measurements, the effects of treatment, um, really covered only stimulants and non-stimulants and no other psychotropic medication, and then non-medical interventions for both children and for adults with children focusing on parenting and the design of um, play-based um, intervention using games to directly address um, metacognitive executive functioning um, deficits. And then with um, adults, manual-based CBT and mindfulness um, meditation interventions. One of the big difficulties, I would say, in the clinical environment is the abundance of terms that we use to describe um, emotional um, dysregulation or rages or reactivity. Um, but from a diagnostic point of view, the authors remind us that emotional symptoms were actually core criteria before um, DSM-3. And since DSM-3, this was excluded and regarded as an associated feature, but it is actually highly pre prevalent in those with combined features of hyperactivity and impulsivity. And about 40 to 50 percent of children um, with ADHD actually show impairments related to rage and irritability. And so what the authors then go on to describe are phases of emotional expression which is to do with emotion generation and then regulation. And that children with ADHD have problems with both of these, whether they experience positive or negative emotion, emotions. The authors present a prototype, emotion prototype, for um, what we might um, experience in children with ADHD. And if you look at the top, uh, left. Um, this is normal reactivity um, for emotion expression and you'll see that the horizontal line is the threshold for maladaptive emotional experience and that the next one B, C and D are the proposed prototypes for ADHD. The first is high um, emotion impulsivity and high and deficient emotional self-regulation, which is what they um, uh, speak about with ADHD. The authors also say that the, the concept of emotional impulsivity um, should possibly be seen as part of the behavioral impulsivity that one sees um, in, in ADHD and might make a case for including that in the core criteria for ADHD. Um, this is a table of um, other disorders um, that we one might see irritability and how it may differ from ADHD. I found it quite interesting if you look at the top right here that um, they actually um, felt that impulsive aggression was not seen commonly in ADHD. I question that, um, but it might be that what we see are ADHD with comorbid conditions. This is a wide range of rating scales to measure emotional symptoms. In my practice, I don't usually um, uh, use measurements. Um, and so this was really interesting. I will certainly have a look at some of the scales and you'll see many of them are, are new. I'm familiar with some of them. Um, for example, the strengths and difficulties questionnaire, which we do use, but um, I would like to look at the dysregulation um, uh, um, like emotional ability um, on Connor's rating, um, apparently free, I'm not sure, but I will have a look into that. Um, I particularly enjoyed the presidential address of um, by Gabrielle Carsons, 
uh, president of the Academy of Child, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. And um, she wrote um, in January this year um, uh, a really lovely account of her work um, on the topic of emotion dysregulation, both from a research point of view as well as clinical um, experiences, um, including two case reports. Um, she has also um, uh, presented uh, this paper in a YouTube video, so please go and have a look. Moving on, uh, the next two articles are practice guidelines. And the first is a practice guideline for the identification and treatment of individuals with ADHD and comorbid ASD, and the other it's women and girls with ADHD. Um, the first author is Susan Young, um, who presented in this um, conference. And um, I particularly um, appreciated um, this guideline um, and excited to read it. Um, I can certainly not do justice to the extensive content, but highly recommend that this paper be read. And the authors took a lifespan approach with practice recommendations separately for children and for adults. Um, in terms of um, ADHD and ASD, they occur very commonly and the presence of both exacerbates difficulties above those experienced by, other, um, by either condition alone. And there are complex um, assessment issues to consider um, and also um, including the change in symptom presentation over time as uh, hyperactive impulsive symptoms decline during adolescence and there might be improved social communication um, uh, in, um, in ASD. Um, I don't need to remind anybody that these patients really um, ha have high resource needs, including intensive interventions for the um, person with the condition, as well as the need for parent support and parent training. In terms of the guideline, uh, the United Kingdom ADHD Partnership hosted a meeting of experts in ADHD and ASD from a range of disciplines with the aim of reaching a consensus regarding the most appropriate methods to identify and assess co-occurring ADHD and ASD. The meeting was in December 2017, and again, um, just highlighting a few snapshots, the authors highlighted the absolute need for practitioner training and skills and um, suggested that before um, starting an assessment that one should ask parents to provide copies of health records, photographs, videos, and school reports, to ask about key transitions, how important collateral information is, and also to remember that family members or informants may themselves have ADHD and or ASD, and this can really complicate the picture with history taking to remind us that symptoms may be masked and to look or exclude comorbidities as you conduct the initial assessment, not to forget a risk assessment and also that rating scales are not diagnostic instruments, but they aid diagnosis and help to monitor progress. Um, this is a list of barriers to achieving a positive outcome, and I think this is important because Co-occurring ASD and ADHD certainly confers a poorer prognosis in my view. And so it is. it was very, very useful for me to read this, much of which I am already well aware of, but um, just to highlight uh, uh, the most important reminder for me um, was the bottom one, and that is um, not to adhere to the same uh, clinical plan that has been in effect over many years, and that really there needs to be review and modifications in line with developments in the clinical presentations and needs of the child or the adult. The next guideline uh, to do with females with um, 
ASD. This is an excellent and much needed review and personally well timed as a guide for the recently hospitalized 17 year old to my ward um, where um, she presented with ADHD um, that was missed up to the time of the um, admission and ASD only recognized a few months ago um, in a first admission. Um, likewise, the same method was um, um, applied um, uh, with a meeting of experts a year later um, in November 2018, um, covering um, the areas below. And um, these are a summary of the key points as it stands in the article. And again, um, time won't allow me to go through all of them, except to say that it's important to um, be aware of compensatory and coping behaviours and to be aware to that girls with ADHD um, may present as being easily distracted, organized, disorganized, overwhelmed, emotional, and lacking in effort or motivation. And so there is a high risk that they may be misdiagnosed with a mood disorder or even with a borderline personality um, construct. Um, you will see likewise here um, issues around comorbidity, which again can cloud the picture because a young adolescent girl can present, for example, with substance use disorder and uh, to be well aware of the possible underlying ADHD. Um, in the clinical picture. This was a very useful table. Um, it um, highlights the co-occurring functional problems that are commonly seen in girls and women as they get older. Um, again, I'm not going to go through all of these details, but please have a closer look at it and refer to it. In terms of treatment, um, pharmacological treatment would be the same as for boys, um, but the authors, for example, highlight that we just have to be careful around um, co-occurring mood symptoms and that if it's not pervasive, to treat the ADHD core symptoms first and monitor for improvement and then consider initiating treatment for a mood disorder. Um, in terms of non-pharmacological treatment, how important psychoeducation is and how interventions need to be tailored to the needs, not just at home, but at school or work and during social activities. Finally, um, looking at um, the last few articles, this covers um, ADHD risk markers. And um, before I discuss the more kind of biological orientated um, articles, I thought that I should look at um, ADHD behavioral markers first. Um, and what we do know is that neurodevelopmental disorders present with an overlap of impairments. And so multiple diagnoses are the rule rather than the exception. Um, but early detection of the early signs and symptoms should be achievable. The authors say that parents generally become concerned from about the age of 12 to 18, but one could arguably say that this could be even younger, especially in a second or third child. However, it's mandatory that we focus our um, efforts on early intervention in order to attenuate severity and improve outcome even before a formal diagnosis is made. In terms of the method, um, the authors conducted a systematic um, review um, of systematic reviews, sorry, the authors conducted uh, reviews of meta analyses and systematic reviews on the early markers of neurodevelopmental delay in children aged zero to three years and um, looked at the highest level of evidence. The ultimate aim is to design an instrument to detect the full spectrum of neurodevelopmental disorders and failures in typical development. 
and you can see there that there were two meta-analyses, two systematic reviews and 43 articles reviewed in this uh, study. I made this table for myself just to track all the studies and you will see that most of the studies actually focused on ASD, but there were few um, points, um, markers possibly um, that one could um, focus on for ADHD, which is um, in the um, early first year, there might be delays in gross motor development and abnormal movements in uh, young um, in babies who in the future would get a diagnosis of ADHD. There might be delays in speech and language acquisition and that ADHD um, might be linked with higher rates of difficult temperament as young as nine months and also um, significantly um, it was associated with feeding and sleeping problems. The next um, uh, focus was on genetic risk markers and I read this article um, alongside the editorial that was in the same um, publication in the American, the Journal of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. You can see that these are fairly, these are very recent um, articles and the editorial really helped me to understand some of the genetics and um, the statistics in this article. Anyway, um, if one looks at the study, it was a sample of youth referred to a neuropsychiatry um, assessment clinic. You'll see the ages there. Um, they agreed to provide DNA for genotyping so that polygenic risk scores could be determined. They presented with a wide range of psychopathology, as you can see, and they also underwent uh, cognitive testing. And in terms of the results, what they found was that ADHD polygenic risk scores were associated with a broad ADHD diagnosis, both the full and the subthreshold diagnosis, and also associated with working memory problems and aggression. Um, and when they compared youth with different genetic burden, those in the high risk group had more severe symptoms than those in the low risk group on the three most stringent discovery thresholds. And you will see this is just shown in, uh, in the table form, um, the red being the group with the highest polygenic risk scores. Um, the last two articles look at vitamin D levels and risk of offspring ADHD and then inflammation as a marker of future offspring ADHD. If one looks at um, uh, candidate early markers for ADHD, we are already aware that maternal psychological distress may be involved, maternal diet and uh, obesity. But inflammation may be the candidate mechanism and the evidence is point, pointing to cytokine functioning. Um, and so the proposal is that maternal cytokines affect offspring brain development and behavior, and that this may be both an etiological pathway as well as a risk marker for ADHD. So in terms of the study, um, the authors examined third trimester maternal um, cytokines and they conducted interviews and questionnaires um, as well as parent and teacher ratings at, of ADHD when the children were for between 48 and 72 months. You'll see there it was 68 children of 62 mothers. And the results were that maternal cytokine concentrations in the third trimester were associated with increased cytokine concentrations were associated with increased symptoms of ADHD later on. And they suggest that this may be a low cost marker for ADHD risk and also that this is the first prospective study to provide evidence that inflammation may be the underlying mechanism 
contributing mechanism for ADHD. This is an article that um, I would not have had time to review, but I'm putting it here for you to actually um, look at um, in your own time. And this is the last article which looks at um, vitamin D levels and risk of offspring ADHD. Um, published in the Journal of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, also a very recent article. I think it was either August or July 2020. So what we know is that vitamin D is essential to bone growth and development, but new insights have pointed to involvement with the immune system, with the central nervous system, and it's even been associated with disorders such as autism and schizophrenia. So previous studies exploring um, a, a maternal 12 hydroxy uh, vitamin D levels and offspring ADHD have been contradictory, but they've been methodological um, uh, problems. So this study, um, the data was from three national um, Finnish um, national registers. And so it was a very large um, sample uh, we um, routinely maternal serum samples were collected and tested for vitamin D and recorded cases of ADHD um, could be gained from the health um, register. The result um, after um, uh, um, comparing um, these data showed a significant association between decreased 25-hydroxy um, uh, vitamin D levels and increasing risk of ADHD. And the authors say that this is the strongest evidence to date. What are the proposed mechanisms? Well, in animal models, it seems to be pointing to altered dopamine signaling and in terms of human um, models, um, we know that early pregnancy is critical, is a critical period for fetal brain development, and that decreased vitamin D may adversely affect the in utero environment and impact on um, fetal um, programming or brain uh, development. Um, in terms of the mechanism, it seems to be that um, it's to do with signaling and regulation of calcium, which impact on neuroprotective and neurotropic actions. And in terms of schizophrenia and ASD, um, again, it looks like it might be related to alterations in um, dopamine systems that are impacting on abnormal um, attention processing. That is a very brief snapshot of the last two articles because of time, but these are the references. Um, they are all there, um, except maybe for the editorials, they might even be there. Um, but thank you, um, that's the end and well in time. Thank you very much. <laughs>